This was how Jesus, God's son, was born. Mary, a young Jewish girl, had promised Joseph, a Jewish man, to be his wife. While still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph was a godly man, full of integrity, and he didn't want to disgrace Mary. When he learned of her pregnancy, he secretly planned to end their engagement. While he was still debating with himself about what to do, he fell asleep and had a dream from God. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Joseph, do not hesitate to make Mary your wife because the power of the Holy Spirit has given her this baby. She will give birth to a boy and you are to name him Jesus for he will give his life to save the world from their sins. This happened so that what the Lord had spoke through his prophet would come true. Listen, a virgin will be pregnant and she will give birth to a son and he will be known as Emmanuel. During those days, the Roman emperor ordered the first census be taken throughout the empire. So Joseph and Mary left Nazareth and journeyed to their hometown in Judea, to the village of Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, Mary went into labor, and there she gave birth to a baby boy, Jesus. After wrapping him in strips of cloth, they laid him in a manger, since there was no room for them in the inn. In the fields there were shepherds, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord was all around them, and they were afraid. The angels said to them, Do not be afraid. For I have good news of great joy that will be for all people. Well, I want to share this weekend on Christmas. And specifically, I want to take the messages that Jacob, Pastor Jacob, has been sharing uh, out of Psalms 130. And so I'm going to go over and try not to say some of the things he said. And then, of course, I need to fix all the things he messed up. <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding. But this is a very special time for my family and I, and it was 30 years ago approximately that I had to weigh in weeks in sharing on Christmas and having to deal with all the controversy that surrounds Christmas and helping families navigate through the commercialism and materialism and secularism and all those things, but to really see the power of the birth of Jesus and, and what we celebrate at Christmas. And so I have, I have some personal convictions about this that I try to stay away from and not impose on anyone, but I really believe that we need to understand the miracle of Christmas and that we have to understand how this is not an ordinary birth that we are celebrating. This is God becoming flesh. This is Emmanuel, God with us and this event caused a chain of events that has literally changed eternity and changed if you will uh, history itself and so when I talk about Christmas I'm not talking about the date I'm talking about the event and I'm talking about the purpose of Christmas I, I personally don't celebrate a date I celebrate a person and this person and the miracle of this person's conception the miracle of God becoming one of us, how do you even communicate that? I mean, I, there's nothing we can give you as an illustration to feel the, the power of that and the love of that, that God loved us so much that he became one of us, listen, and entered into our sufferings, human suffering. A lot of people think that God is the author of all this evil in our world and all this death and sickness and pain, and God has nothing to do with with any of that and others think God doesn't care and why won't he do something I'm here to tell you that he did something 2,000 years ago he became one of us and suffered with us and if we will suffer with him now we will reign in eternity forever and ever and ever God God identified with every part of the human experience except sin Except sin. He never sinned, but he experienced brokenness of heart. He's lost a father or a stepfather, and he knows that pain. He knows the, 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 the pain of a family being pursued and your life being under threat. And you having to flee for your life. On and on we could go with the beauty of this. And so, it's very special to me 
because 30 years ago, again, I had to spend weeks explaining things because of, of just controversy surrounding Christmas itself, even among believers. I remember one of the arguments was, well, if you read the book of Acts all the way through Revelation, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't talk about anybody celebrating uh, Christmas or his birthday. It's all about the resurrection. It's all about the resurrection, and we need to be focused on the resurrection. Hey, I'm, I'm all in on the power of the resurrection, and that's a powerful focus, but there would be no resurrection without the birth of Jesus. There would be none of the events, none of the mirror. It all started with this miraculous event that has not only brought great faith throughout the world, it has given us all great hope of God's love for us and God's faithfulness to us and his promises for the future. So let's, let's start in, in Psalms 130 where, where Pastor Jacob's been for a few weeks and, and see if I can say some things here to help us. Uh, Psalms 130 verse 1, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. For mercy. Notice that this starts off with the psalmist pleading and appealing to God's mercies. God's mercy is huge in our lives and in our families and our children have to understand it. One of the things that you have to understand to really appreciate mercy is justice. Is justice and a God of justice. And we hear a lot about justice, a lot about justice today in our culture. And I don't want to get hung up there. My, my time is limited, but we need to be careful what we're listening to and who we're listening to because there's a, there's a group of people in our world today that are so focused and obsessed with social justice, but they don't understand the justice of God. That within God's justice is just justice. Anything that promotes unjustice in the name of justice is a perversion of God's justice. And we have to teach our children justice. We have to teach them God's holiness. We have to teach them boundaries. We have to teach them consequences for how we live our lives and, and things of that nature. But one of the main reasons to teach them God's justice is so they can understand God's mercy. Some Christians, man, they're so hung up like the world on, on, on justice that I've heard Christians praying before and, and I've gotten nervous in the middle of the prayer praying with them that they're, they're crying out to God for justice and Lord, I deserve better than this. And they're screaming at God that they deserve justice. And I'm thinking, that silence you hear on the other end, that's called mercy, hallelujah. I'm all for social justice in a just way, but I tell you, we need a... We need a, an army that's a different kind of army. You hear today about social justice warriors. How many of you know we need social mercy warriors in this hour? Amen. We need to be a people of mercy and God's great mercy in the earth today. And Christmas testifies of the tender mercies, mercies of God for, for us, his people, and for Israel. And so I want to I share some more down that line. Look at the next verse, man. It's powerful. Verse 3. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. The word feared here doesn't mean be afraid of God or scared of God. It means reverence. It means, it means being, to be in awe of God and to worship God. The source of us being in awe of God and the source of, of worship comes from understanding his forgiveness for us and how complete it is and how redeemed we are and how he has saved us to the utmost and from all the things that, that he has saved us, saved us from. Man, I want to understand the forgiveness of God and how complete it is and that God didn't just forgive me of my past sins but has already extended forgiveness for any sin in my life right now that I may be, may be committed and sins I haven't, I haven't even, even committed. I've taught you thoroughly how God's forgiveness is a complete forgiveness, past, present, and future tense. And we need to understand that. And our children need to understand that early, the forgiveness of God and the complete forgiveness of God. He goes on to, to, to say that I wait for the Lord. My soul waits and his word I hope. We have to put our hope in this hour, in these last days, in the Word of God 
not all that's going on in our world. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. Going back to those previous verses, he said, if God marked our iniquities, who could stand? The answer is none. None of us could stand if God held our our sins against us. None of us could stand if God held our shortcomings against us. None of us could stand independent of his forgiveness or stand independent of redemption. Because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And none of us are perfect after the flesh. And when he says, if God marked iniquities, he's not talking about just the bad ones. There are some sins that have greater consequences and worse than other sins horizontally. But from God's view, sin is sin. And if God holds any sin against you, if God punishes you for any sin, if God pours any kind of wrath out on you or curse at all on you for any sin, which sin would it be? It would be any sin. And again, God doesn't grade on a curve. I grew up in school where we had to grade on a curve. And some Christians think that that God's under some quota and he's got to take the top 10%. So if you make the top 10%, you're going to get to go to heaven. How many of you have discovered you can't go to heaven unless you're perfect? You have to be perfect to go to heaven. When I say perfect, you have to be perfect in word, thought, deed, and listen, attitude. Did I get everybody? (laughs) And you had to be perfect all the time. So either you have to be perfect in word, thought, deed, or attitude, or you have to have a Savior, a Redeemer. I opted for the Savior, the Redeemer, amen? I, I really want to be holy, and I endeavor to live a holy life, but... I fall short in word, thought, deed, or attitude. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't fall near as short of as you guys do. (laughs) I'm just kidding. But I need to understand forgiveness. I need to understand redemption. I need to put my hope in the Lord, not myself. My hope in the Lord and his righteousness by faith, not my my own righteousness. And this is what is being celebrated in this psalm is the forgiveness of God and the hope we have in the, the faithfulness of God. I love the, the next two verses. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel of how many of her iniquities? All. And all means all. Again, every time I talk about past tense sins, present tense sins, And future tense sins, religious people really get uncomfortable. And I I can remember years ago especially, I'd be teaching on the redemption of Jesus and the complete forgiveness we have. How we're forgiven of all sin. He's already extended forgiveness in this man, Jesus, of past, present, and future tense sins. And people just have a fit. How how can God forgive a sin before you even even commit it? Well, how many of you know that God forgave you at the cross 2,000 years ago? All of your sins technically are future tense. You're future tense. And so if God can't forgive a sin before we commit it, then we're up a creek without a paddle, as, as my daddy used to say all the time. Hallelujah. And, and I'm thankful for the full, complete redemption of Jesus, that when Jesus entered this world, when the immaculate conception in the, in the womb of a, a virgin girl, teenage girl, what faith Mary had. One of the reasons I like celebrating Christmas is honoring Mary in the, pri- in the proper way. I don't er- honor Mary in worshiping her or, or bowing down to her or praying to her, but I do honor her every year. I take time and honor her publicly, honor her in my heart for her faith to believe God to have a baby without a relationship with a human. But that the Holy Spirit came upon her and she supernaturally conceived. And God entered into to human expression in her womb. And then, and then born, then born among the humblest of us. You would think God being made flesh. And again, how do you explain that? This doesn't even come close. I've thought this out and prayed about it and I can't come up with an illustration. But that would like, be like one of us becoming an ant. That would take a lot of humility. Can I get a witness? But that doesn't come close to explaining God made one of us. Becoming one of us and trusting us. Trusting Mary. 
trusting Joseph, trusting, trusting uh, again, I already said Mary, uh, to, to raise the holy child Jesus. It, it's just, mirac- all of it gives me goosebumps. All of it just excites me. I, I have a hard time sharing and staying focused because my brain just goes everywhere with the, the celebration of this. And again, all of heaven, go to Luke chapter 2, all of heaven recognizing the birth of Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, we have the account of Jesus' birth. And because of time constraints, I was going to read verses 1 through 14. The intro, the video intro that we did, it pretty well covered the story. Biblical-based story of Jesus and him entering into humanity, this miraculous birth. And so I'm going to skip verses 1 through 8. You can read them on your own. And again, the video covered them. But I'm going to start at verse 8 where this angel begins to talk and declare to the shepherds that were in a field the announcement of this wonderful, again, event. Look at verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. So it was shepherds, plural. We don't know how many but it's more than one. So it's shepherds that are watching over their flock. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were filled with great fear. Now this word fear does mean to be afraid. It kind of spooked them. And look at what the angel said. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for how many people? This news is great, is good news, it's great joy, and it's for all people. And I believe in context where it says all people, I believe it means all people for all time. That this is an event worth celebrating. This is an event worth pausing and teaching our children early. Forgiveness and giving and sharing and what love looks like in in sharing what we have. Because God ultimately shared what he had, that's the most important gift that's ever been given on this planet. And I like to say it's the gift that keeps on giving. Amen. Amen. Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. And so I want to go back to years ago. I had to spend weeks dealing with all the different issues that people get hung up on. And I don't want to do that. I don't have that time. Uh, that's pretty well Pastor Austin's job now. And, and Pastor Jacob, as they feel led, what you, what you need to know and what's going on. But one of the things that I do want to lean in on is what the young people are going through with social media. And, and our young people are being exposed to things on social media. And they're trying to answer back on social media and not being as qualified as they need to be to defend the scriptures. And so one of the things that the young people are constantly hearing is, again, we shouldn't celebrate, break, Christmas it's a it's a pagan religion and so we need to just stay away from it totally well wow uh again you you have a right to your own beliefs there and I'm not trying to persuade anyone I'm just telling you where I'm coming from in this if celebrating Christian is a pagan religion why is it pagans that are trying to cancel it if it's such a great pagan religion why aren't the pagans promoting it and celebrating it and, and attacking us. No, the pagans are the ones that are trying to eliminate it from our culture. And eliminate it from our, from our homes. And secondly, if it is a pagan religion, I wish we had more pagan religions that you hear about Jesus in the malls. Amen. It's the only time of the year you hear about Jesus everywhere you go. So I'm voting for more pagan religions. Now, one of the things that I shared years ago in detail, I'm just going to highlight it, is... Out of verse 14, we need to get there. But before I get there, the angel from heaven said, Behold, I bring you good news. Everybody say good news. news. And great joy. Say "Great great joy. Then the angel announced the birth of Jesus. Guess what the gospel is called? The good news. A part of the gospel is the birth of Jesus. Again, they talk about how it's not talked about from Acts all the way through the Bible, but the resurrection is the focus. But in the book of Acts chapter, I believe it's chapter 2 when they all prayed. It might be chapter 4. Somewhere in there it's written. 
that they prayed in the name of the holy child, Jesus. I'm the only person I've ever heard pray like that. Right out of the Bible, that in the book of Acts, they prayed in the name of the holy child, Jesus. So Jesus as a child has a significance that wasn't eliminated after the resurrection. There wouldn't have been a resurrection without it. So, let's read on and then look at verse 14. For unto you is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Notice that Jesus is not Savior and Christ after the resurrection, but he's Savior and Christ in the manger. That's pretty powerful. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. We even flower that up. How humble is that? The king of kings born in a barn. A barn. There was no room in the inn, which was a type of house that had extra rooms that they rented out. And, and they had to stay in a, a barn. And we're not talking about a barn like we have, most of us. That's halfway decent barns. And he's, he's li- he lies in a manger, meaning a wooden trough with hay in it that animals have been eating. We're all shook up over COVID-19. COVID means animal. COVID means animal. Animals had been eating out of that trough and drooling in that trough. And that hay had animal drool. Talk about COVID. (laughs) And Jesus born in the mid of (laughs) COVID-1. This is a humble setting. Jesus could have been born anywhere to anybody in any kind of social class status. And he's born in a barn, an animal stable, cave literally, with a wooden, a wooden manger. That's just incredible. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now we're using the ESV version Because I'm I'm literally submitting to Pastor Jacob and I'm preaching his his outline. And he wanted the ESV version. So I submitted. But that isn't a very good version. (laughs) The King James is actually better in verse 14 than that version. The King James Bible says, glory to God in the highest. Listen, peace on earth Good will toward men. That was announced by an angel and celebrated by the entire host of heaven. So let me go through six witnesses quickly. I'm just going to give you these quickly. So if you take a notice, they're not in the outline. But these are things I taught for an hour, maybe two hours a few years ago. But there were, there's six biblical witnesses of celebrating Jesus' birth. Not a day, but an event And a human being, God made flesh. So the first one that I just read, and I'm going to break verse 14 down into three, three sections. The first one is glory to God in the highest. What did the angel say to the shepherds? And how did the angel act about the birth of Jesus? The angel gave God glory in the highest. And when the angel that spoke to the shepherds, gave God glory, gave gave God praise for the birth of Jesus, the Bible says all of heaven, heaven's host, praised God for the birth of Jesus. So I don't know who you're running running around with and who you hang out with, but I'm going to hang out with the angel that said glory to God in the highest, not for his resurrection, though we should give glory for that, but for his birth, and all of heaven. I don't even know what that means. All of the host of heaven at the birth of Jesus celebrated his birth. So there's two witnesses. The third one is the shepherds that the angel told. The shepherds went and found Jesus in the stable and they gave God glory. They gave God thanks. They celebrated the birth of Jesus. And listen at this. You you, you usually never hear this. They celebrated the birth of Jesus. Listen. And it says they went everywhere and told everybody. They couldn't have been telling everybody about the resurrection. They were telling everybody about the birth of Jesus and that this was the beginning of the end for Satan. This was the beginning of the end for darkness. This was the beginning of the end for the sufferings of the world. 
that would ultimately, yes, end in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the new creation. But they celebrated, the shepherds celebrated the birth of Jesus. Number four, the wise men, the magi, gave gifts to Jesus and they praised God for the birth of Jesus. They praised God for his life. Pastor Pastor Austin is going to share on the Magi, I think next weekend, correct? He's going to share on the Magi. You need to be here for that because you don't hear a lot about the Magi. And he's got some really good things God has shown him about these, what we call wise men. It's translated wise men in the King James Bible, but in other translations, the Magi. And these were, these were awesome, wise men. And let me clear something up here that a lot of people don't understand. They didn't go to the to the manger. They didn't show up at the barn. In Matthew chapter 2 verse 10, you'll find that the Magi did not find Jesus for some time later. And it says they came to his house. So the shepherds went to the manger. The wise men, Magi, went to the, to the house and, and gave gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, and, and, and they rejoiced and they celebrated the life of Jesus, the birth, the birth of Jesus. So I don't know who you hang out with, but I'm going to hang out with wise men. Amen. And I'm going to join the wise men, and, and I'm going to give gifts to the Lord. I give gifts to the Lord all year round, and the way I do that is his body in the earth. And you need to teach your children early that we're given these gifts, and, and they're because of God's love, and that as the people of God, this is what we do for our fellow, fellow man. Number, number five, Simeon was in the temple, and Simeon was a very godly, devout man in the temple at this time, and every firstborn child had to be dedicated to, to the Lord in the temple, and it was on the eighth day. Every child born, the first that, that, that came from the womb, had to be given to the Lord. And so Joseph and Mary, following Jewish law and tradition, took Jesus to the temple. Watch this. And Simeon rejoiced and called him the Savior of, of Israel and that his eyes had seen God's Redeemer. Think of how close this man was to God in his culture. That the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you will not die Till you see the Savior of the world. And when he saw him, listen, eight days later, he rejoiced and praised God. So he didn't praise and worship a day. He praised and worshiped the birth of the Savior of the world. The next witness is Anna, the prophetess. Anna was in that same temple. And she gave thanks to God when she saw Jesus and called him the Redeemer of Jerusalem. So she celebrated the birth of Jesus eight days later. I'm, I'm not too caught up in what day we celebrate because the book of Colossians warns us about celebrating certain days or moons, period. And so I'm not hung up on that, but I sure am hung up with Jesus and all those that celebrated his birth. And I say to you today, I love the Lord and I'm excited about his birth and his resurrection. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The second thing in verse, verse 14 is peace on earth. What the angels and all of heaven celebrated was peace on earth. How do you reconcile a verse like that with other verses even in the Bible and our human experience with the lack of peace on this earth? How do you reconcile that? Peace on earth. Jesus himself said... In his adult life, in his ministry, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, do not think that I came to send peace on the earth. I didn't come to send peace on the earth, but a sword. I come to set at variance, man from father, daughter from mother, daughter-in-law from mother-in-law. And then he he explains the whole thing when he talks about in the next few verses being his disciple. And that in being his disciple, there will be a division come. There will be a divide that you have to love Jesus more than family. Love Jesus more than material gain. Love Jesus more than you fill in the blank. 
And other scriptures as well where Jesus even told us that in the last days there would be wars and rumors of wars. But let not your heart be troubled about these things. How do you reconcile all of heaven and this angel saying peace on earth? How many of you know the peace that is on earth is between God and man? God is not angry with us any longer. God is not mad at us anymore. God's not punishing us. Sin is still deadly. Sin is still dangerous. It has consequences. But God's not the one punishing us for any sin. God will never be angry with us again. God will never turn on us again. He'll never fail us again. There were three things in Psalms 103 that he said in that last verse. One was his steadfast love, plentiful in redemption, and then all of our sins being forgiven. Aren't you glad God's love is steadfast in your life? All of us have experienced, maybe the kids haven't yet, but if, if they grow up to be adults, all of us in this life experience a temporal love from somebody, a conditional love from somebody, a situation where you're loved and then you mess up and you ain't loved no more. Many, unfortunately, have gone through the, the, the heartbreak of a divorce where there was such love there, but it wasn't a steadfast love, it was a temporal love, it was a exhaustive love and they experienced the pain uh, uh, of a divorce I'm so glad God's love for me is steadfast because man I've messed up and I'm failing and I fall but I, I, I love knowing I can jump up with all confidence and run straight to him knowing that he's plentiful in redemption remember that phrase plentiful aren't you glad God's redemption it and piddling little it is just so piddling little. It'll cover this. It'll cover that. It's kind of like an insurance policy. <laughs> Amen. And yet God's, God's redemption is plentiful. And then he has forgiven how many of our sins? All of our sins. Last one. And I'll close. He says, glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. God will make peace. With the whole world through the blood of his cross. Colossians chapter 2 verse 10 says. And then he says good will toward men. I want to encourage you and I want to encourage you to teach your children. And to pound it in their head. God doesn't will anything but good for you. Then we have to teach them in this world. We're going to experience bad. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. There will be persecutions. There, there will be opposition. But you never, ever need to doubt God's will for you. And listen, he has no ill will for you. I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times, saints, I've been in a hard place personally. Our church has been a hard place. And what I'm saying to you is so alive in my heart and so important that, God, this looks terrible. It feels terrible. I don't, I don't know where you are. It's not right what's happening. But I know this. You will nothing but good for me. When Jesus came into this world, all of heaven, and that angel promised, God has no ill will now and will will nothing but good for you. So even in bad places, Romans chapter 8, we know because we love God and we're called according to his purpose, he's going to work it together for our good. God's going to bring good out of bad, but he's not the author of any of this bad. Amen. God's not killing your kids. Amen. Amen. Man, that's exciting to me. So I pray that you have the best Christmas ever. Amen.